Tonight, the United States government has openly accused Vladimir Putin of war crimes. But how does the U.S. plan to hold him accountable if it still isn't a member of the International Criminal Court? I'll speak about war crimes with the very first prosecutor for that court, Luis Moreno Ocampo. And a federal ruling found it was more likely than not that Trump committed a felony in his efforts to obstruct Congress and overturn the election. We'll have the latest on the January 6th committee. Plus, President Biden's new budget has some good and some bad, but the best measure in and there just might be his new tax on billionaires. Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Human history often turns on minor figures like Peter von Hagenbach. He was a knight in French Burgundy in the 1400s when the Duke put him in charge of keeping order on the Upper Rhine. But Peter's army terrorized the population with campaigns of murder and rape. And in 1474, after a rebellion against Peter, 28 judges from around the Holy Roman Empire gathered to try him for violating, quote, the laws of God and man. He defended himself by saying he was just following the Duke's instructions. Quote, is it not known that soldiers owe absolute obedience to their superiors? The judges disagreed. Peter von Hagenbach was convicted and beheaded. His trial is considered to be the first known international criminal tribunal and the first implicit rejection of the just following orders defense against war crimes. Hundreds of years before the Hague and Geneva Conventions or the Allied trials of Nazi criminals at Nuremberg, calling out war crimes is not new. But it's undergone something of a renaissance in the past 30 years. It started with the prosecution of warmongering Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic for genocide and other crimes in the Balkans wars. He died during the trial. At the same time, officials in Britain pursued charges against Chilean former right-wing dictator Augusto Pinochet, who also died while under indictment. But those cases inspired the creation of an international criminal court at The Hague in 2002. 123 member nations have signed on to the court and it has issued arrest warrants for African warlords, a son of Muammar Gaddafi, and even Omar al-Bashir, the former dictator of Sudan, who once sheltered Osama bin Laden. This flurry of interest in human rights prosecutions around the world led one political scientist to describe the era as a justice cascade. While progress has been slow, the documentation of war crimes has become easier than ever in an electronic, interconnected world. One need only look at Russian President Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, where the accusations are flying and the evidence is piling up. That audio, obtained by the New York Times, appears to be Russian forces outside Kyiv covering a retreat by ordering their artillery to rain fire indiscriminately on residential neighborhoods. A war crime. And one that appears evident in the Russian shelling of terrified, hungry civilians in cities like Mariupol, too. It's there that the Russians fired on a maternity hospital, an attack that killed at least one pregnant woman. An attack that the Russians, without evidence, blamed on Ukrainian neo-Nazis. And it was there that women and children took shelter in a local theater, painting the Russian word for children on the ground so that Russian bomber pilots could see it. That theater was bombed. Again, the Russians denied doing it and again claimed without evidence that the Ukrainians had bombed themselves. And a consensus is gathering that, like Peter von Hagenbach over 700 years ago, the man in charge is responsible for these atrocities. The single most important thing that uh, we can do from the outset is keep the democracies united in our opposition and our effort to curtail the devastation that is occurring at the hands of a man who, I quite frankly, think is a war criminal. And, and I think it will meet the legal definition of that as well. American presidents don't make such statements lightly. But the State Department has concluded that Russia is committing war crimes in Ukraine. It's been gathering evidence from day one of Putin's invasion to share with prosecutors, perhaps at the International Criminal Court, whose investigation has been underway for a month. 
though its case is complicated and its options are limited because Russia has never signed on to the International Criminal Court. And despite America's sudden zeal for prosecuting war crimes, Russian war crimes, the U.S. has never supported the ICC either. Bill Clinton signed on to it at its creation, but it never got ratified. And in 2002, on the eve of the war in Iraq, George W. Bush informed the United Nations that he was taking the U.S. out of the court's jurisdiction, just in time for Fallujah, for Abu Ghraib, for the massacres at Mahmoudiyah and Haditha, all alleged war crimes and all part of America's own illegal invasion of Iraq. And then, of course, there's the torture of detainees at CIA black sites around the world. Did Barack Obama's hope and change extend to international accountability for war crimes? Not so much. He kept us out of the ICC and even said this shortly before being sworn in in 2009. Obviously, we're going to be looking at past practices. Uh, and uh, I don't believe that anybody is above the law. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I also have a belief that we need to look forward as, low, as opposed to look, looking backwards. Looking forward, not back, on war crimes like torture was a huge mistake by Obama. But he had nothing on Donald Trump who proudly granted clemency to several convicted or suspected war criminals in Iraq and Afghanistan, not just soldiers, but mercenaries, too. Trump even imposed sanctions on the ICC, on ICC prosecutors, for daring to investigate possible U.S. war crimes in Afghanistan. And he trotted out Secretary of State Mike Pompeo with this chilling message. We cannot and we will not stand by as our people are threatened by a kangaroo court. And indeed, I have a message to many close allies around the world. Your people could be next. I guess Pompeo was right. If the ally he was talking about at the time was Russia. The Biden administration has lifted those sanctions on the ICC, but still criticizes the international court and human rights groups when it comes to their investigations of potential war crimes by the United States itself and by allies of the U.S., like Israel. So when we ask what should or what could happen to Putin... We also have to ask, what is the U.S. really willing to do about it? Are we the exceptional nation that continues to accept ourselves from international justice and the institutions of international justice? Or does the widespread outrage at the crimes of Putin and his military in Ukraine prove that America can and must lead by a much better example than it has so far? Who better to discuss this with than Luis Moreno Ocampo? He served as the first prosecutor of the International Criminal Court from 2003 to 2012 and has prosecuted three heads of state for crimes against humanity. Thank you so much for coming on the show this evening. First off, in an ideal world, how is Vladimir Putin made accountable for his war crimes in Ukraine? And hasn't he already gotten away with doing war crimes in Chechnya, in Syria, in the Donbass over the past two decades? Well, neither Syria or Chechnya are member are part of the ICC, so ICC has no jurisdiction. It's like requesting a German prosecutor to investigate Putin in Russia or, or Bush in the U.S. The, the prosecutor is not the world prosecutor. The prosecutor, IC, ICC prosecutor, is the prosecutor of the country who ratified the treaty. In this case, Ukraine accepts jurisdiction of the ICC. That's why the war crimes eventually committed in Ukraine could be investigated. Could Putin be personally indicted? Depends. Depends on the evidence. If you have evidence that Putin ordered to commit war crimes, yes, could be. If not, it would be something that someone different. The issue but for me he, is, yeah. Yes. No, no, please finish your answer. No, 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 go ahead. I was gonna ask, you mentioned indicting Putin. Let's say he is indicted. That's only step one. You still have to get him to the court. Uh, the ICC doesn't have enforcement powers. Uh, to quote Stalin on the Pope, how many divisions does the ICC have? And when you look at, for example, Omar al-Bashir, the, the former Sudanese dictator, your team got an indictment for him when you were at the ICC, the first sitting national leader to face a war crimes prosecution. Last summer, Sudan announced it would hand Bashir over to the ICC. But it still hasn't. The original indictment, I think, was 2008. That's 14 years and counting since you first indicted him. No wonder Putin isn't worried about ever being dragged in front of a war crimes court. Well, that shows no judge, no prosecutor has it, its own police, his own police. When the judge in the U.S. issue instruction or the, or the prosecutor indicts someone in a grand jury, the FBI, the police follow the judges. Here the same. 
the police, the armies, and the states. So the responsibility to implement arrest warrant at the state. Example, Bashir. President Obama, indeed to try to arrest Bashir, decided to use the ICC arrest warrant to leverage his negotiation with Bashir to free the South of Sudan. He did it. He obtained the South Sudan independence. But the cause was genocide in Darfur continue until it was removed by a coup d'etat. And now Bashir is in jail. We'll see when and if it goes or not to, to the ICC. But it's one of his colonels, a militia leader, today in the ICC under, under trial. So it takes time, but it's happening. That's why, yes, different than in the, in the Nazi time, we have crime not very clearly. But stopping so, crime so is not enough of the court. You need a, a so you need yes. to stop crime. To, to stop crime. So in, in order to stop crime, you have to stop wars. You, if you like to stop war crimes, stop wars, not just Ukrainian war. Let's say, is, yeah. let's say Putin is indicted, but he never gets to a trial. What happens next? Is there a case, uh, could this be a case, where he's then very limited on where he can travel in retirement, should he ever decide to retire? Could he face extradition once he's a private citizen? Should he ever become a private citizen again? Yes, of course. Look, the, the SEC indicted President Bashir, and then after years, he, he was demoted. Gaddafi was killed. Uh, the only person arrested, in fact, was President Gagbo from Ivory Coast. And then the court acquitted him. <laughs> and so maybe at the end, of the, at the, at the, end the, the, the best destiny for the three presidents we indicted in my time was Gagbo, who was acquitted. So, but the problem is, but even acquittal of Gagbo did not change that today Ivory Coast is stable, is in peace, mostly. So the issue is not just about convicting the, the responsible, it will take time sometimes because there are people with a lot of power. The issue is to stop wars, because that is for me the, the way to stop war crimes is to stop wars. And not just yes. war in Crimea, not, not just war in, in Ukraine. For me, I'm, I'm shocked. It's a new war after Ukraine. In, in Armenia, Azerbaijan invaded Armenia. And you know why they did it? Because the, the peacekeeper role in Armenia was Russia. So Azerbaijan took advantage that Russia is busy in, in Ukraine and invaded Armenia. And, and we don't talk about Armenia. Come on. Hundred years ago, we had Armenian Let genocide. me ask you this. Let me ask you this, before, because we're going to run out of time, but I have to ask you something about what you did when you were ICC prosecutor. In 2006, I believe, you looked into allegations of war crimes against the Bush administration and the Blair government in the UK in relation to their invasion of Iraq, illegal invasion of Iraq. You ultimately declined to prosecute because the alleged crimes weren't grave enough. Do you regret that decision at all? Do you think that set a precedent for superpowers who aren't party to the court, like the US and Russia? Thank you for the question, Nick. Allow me to clarify. Aggression crime in my time was not possible to investigate because the decision to prosecute that we can prosecute aggression crime started in 2017, not in my time. I left in 2012. So I had no jurisdiction against US troops. I was monitoring crimes committed by UK. In those days, the ICC had not enough evidence to consider crimes were committed serious enough to prosecute UK troops. Later, Fatou Ben Souda, the person you, the picture you showed, my successor, reopened the process and again examined, examined what's happened with the crimes committed in Iraq. So that's what happened. Look, I, as a prosecutor, you follow the evidence. That's why in the Putin case, one problem is the first problem we have is to collect the evidence. But to protect the Ukrainians is not enough to stop war crimes. We should stop the war. And to protect the world, to learn about what happened, we need to stop all the wars. Mandela, Nelson Mandela say, I never lose. I win or, or I learn. We need to learn about wars in Ukraine, in Armenia, and stop wars. We will have to leave it there. Luis Moreno Ocampo, thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate it. So what is the best way to get Putin to the negotiating table? Maybe, some would argue, holding him accountable for war crimes isn't the best way to do that. What you do need to do, they would say, is give Putin an off-ramp. Build him a golden bridge from which to retreat, to quote Sun Tzu. 
There are signs that Russia may be willing to retreat if it isn't retreating already. A member of Putin's inner circle, his Security Council chief, Nikolai uh, Patrushev, told a Russian news agency that a change of government in Ukraine is not Russia's goal. Really? That's probably news to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. So what can you offer Putin to end the war that Ukrainians might possibly accept? The president of Ukraine has suggested neutrality as one possible way forward, one that may be the best way to save Ukrainian lives. But would Ukraine as a whole, would the Ukrainian people accept that in a referendum if it also meant splitting the country between occupied and unoccupied regions? The head of Ukraine's military intelligence claims that Putin may seek that outcome, comparing it to the dividing line between North and South Korea, which was the result, of course, of the ceasefire that halted the fighting 70 years ago during the Korean War but never ended that war. This week, Turkey could be hosting face-to-face -face talks between Russia and Ukraine as early as Tuesday. But any deal between the two sides would have to get U.S. sign-off. President Joe Biden is back in Washington after a trip to Europe that has focused a lot of attention on what the end game should be. For more on that, let's turn now to Stephen Mull, former U.S. ambassador to Poland during the second term of the Obama administration, now the vice provost for global affairs at the University of Virginia. Ambassador, thanks so much for joining me on the show tonight. If these negotiations proceed this week, is President Joe Biden helping them or hurting them when he says stuff like this? Have a listen. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Mr. President, were you calling for regime change? No. Do you believe what you said, that Putin can't remain in power? Or do you now regret saying that because your government has been trying to walk that back? Did your words complicate matters? Number one, I'm not walking anything back. The fact of the matter is I was expressing the more outrage I felt toward the way Putin is dealing and the actions of this man just, just brutality of it. Half the children in Ukraine. I just come from being with those families. And, uh, and so, uh, but I want to make it clear, I wasn't then, nor am I now, articulating a policy change. Ambassador, whatever moral outrage he may feel, we may all feel, it's not exactly the best rhetoric to get Vladimir Putin to the table, is it? Well, good evening, Betty. It's good to be with you. I, I think there's a risk of overstating the risk of, of this comment. After all, within minutes after the president initially said those words on Saturday night in Warsaw, his advisors were already stressing that the goal of the United States in helping Ukraine is not to remove Vladimir Putin from power. But more to the point, Vladimir Putin has believed for at least the last 10 years, if not more, that the United States is trying to remove him from power. It's something that he says that motivates all of his uh, reaction to, to the United States. So there's really nothing new here. It's, it's not true. The United States isn't trying to remove him. Putin thinks that he is, or at least uses that to uh, justify whatever policy he decides to undertake. I don't really think uh, this is going to have much of an impact on these negotiations at all. Russian representatives may try to score points on it, but I don't think the Ukrainians, who are the partners in this negotiation, are going to, it's not going to mean much to them at all. I believe you were ambassador in Poland the last time Russia invaded Ukraine and started chipping away at its borders and sovereignty. Do you believe Russian spy chief Nikolai Patrushev, who is now saying that eastern Ukraine was always Russia's goal in this invasion? Personally, I think that beggars belief, given how far Russian troops uh, invaded from the north and advanced so aggressively onto Kyiv. But maybe we uh, have to let the Kremlin have this fantasy as an off-ramp. Well, in indeed, it is a convenient fallback position for the, the, the Kremlin uh, to uh, say that they're willing to uh, accept that. What's going to be more important, I think, obviously, this would be a very difficult choice for President Zelensky to make. So far, he's vowing that he will not compromise Ukraine's territorial integrity. There are some credible reports coming out from the negotiations that are supposed to take place in Istanbul tomorrow that the sides will kick down the road the question of what to do about the two breakaway provinces and the Crimea, that that dis disagreement on that won't get in the way of a ceasefire between Russia and Ukraine uh, while they address other other issues. So, but you're, you're right. I, I think that would be uh, a fallback position that could give Putin a face-saving way out of this mess. But it's unclear and if the Ukrainians will agree to it. 
Of course. From a security standpoint, let's talk about not Ukraine, but Poland, where you served. What do you think Poland, a NATO member, wants to see in any potential peace deal reached by Ukraine and Russia? Does, does Poland have a particular angle here, given they're worried about being next? Well, I think uh, the people who follow this situation closely in Poland already realize that Ukrainian NATO membership is not going to be on the horizon anytime soon. I think they would be, uh, our Polish friends would be willing to accept what President Zelensky has already floated, this concept of a of neutrality for Ukraine, provided that part of the deal is guaranteeing Ukraine's security. I understand that the document on under discussion between the Russians and Ukrainians for the negotiations coming up do, does have an idea of Ukraine's security being guaranteed by Russia, the United States, other key NATO allies like Germany, France, Britain, Poland, Canada, and even maybe maybe China. So if that, if Ukraine's security were guaranteed that there's no danger of Russia invading again, posing a direct threat on Poland's border, I think Poland could uh, could live with that. And Ambassador, Poland has been, is being, an extraordinary neighbor to Ukraine. It says it has welcomed well over 2 million refugees into the country so far, more than every other country combined. How do you explain that kind of undeniable generosity, given how anti-migrant Poland has been when those migrants happen to be from the Middle East? Well, I think there's a, a big difference in the situations, uh, yeah, as, as you're referencing uh, last year, when Belarus, probably with Russian backing, was actively promoting the, tr the transit of refugees from the Middle East and South Asia into the European Union, probably as a tactic to sow division between Poland and the rest of, of Europe and to cause political instability in Europe. Ukraine, even before this war started, there were between one and two million Ukrainians living in in Poland, making a very strong contribution to the economy. Uh, on my visits to Poland, I've uh, even since being ambassador, I've always been struck how warmly welcomed the Ukrainians are. There's a big cultural affinity between Poles and their next door neighbors, much as there would be between Americans and Canadians. Uh, uh, the, the, you always want to be more helpful to your immediate neighbors. And what binds them together even further is they both have common experience of occupation and domination by Russia. That has a tendency to bring people together and make you them open think, their homes and hearts. Uh, those, are all, those are all fair points, and you're right about being neighbors and affinities, but you don't think there's a brazen element of racism from the right-wing people who run the Polish government? Well, there are racists in every country, but I think, uh, as far as I've heard, uh, the Polish government has been absolutely certain that even people of color uh, fleeing Ukraine have been allowed to cross the border to move on back to their uh, to their home country. So I think the Polish government's been working very hard to prove that, that uh, they are not uh, reacting to this crisis with, with any degree of racism. That doesn't mean there, there are certainly extremist groups in Poland, just as there are in every country, who have tried to make political hay out of this and trying to mobilize people against people of color coming into their country. But, but by and large, everyone who's wanted to flee Ukraine has been able to cross the Polish border. Ambassador Stephen Moll will have to leave it there. Thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Coming up, a victory for the January 6th panel. A judge says lawyer John Eastman, Trump lawyer, former Trump lawyer John Eastman, remember him, must hand over documents about his work helping pressure Vice President Mike Pence to block the vote count on January 6th. We're back after a break. Breaking news on the domestic front today. A federal judge found that more likely than not, President Trump committed felony obstruction in his effort to overturn the election on January the 6th, 2021. The ruling has no direct role in whether Trump will be charged criminally. It was part of a civil case over the January 6th committee's demand for access to emails from Trump lawyer John Eastman. He sued to block the committee, citing attorney-client privilege, but the judge ruled against him, ordering him to turn over 101 of the 111 emails requested. The 44-page ruling is extremely forceful 
with Judge Carter writing, Our nation was founded on the peaceful transition of power, epitomized by George Washington laying down his sword to make way for democratic elections. Ignoring this history, President Trump vigorously campaigned for the vice president to single-handedly determine the results of the 2020 election with a plan this bold. President Trump knowingly tried to subvert this fundamental principle. That's what Judge Carter thinks of January the 6th. But right now, everyone's wondering about another judge, one of the highest in the nation, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, whose wife Ginny also seems to have gotten herself tangled up in this more likely than not illegal scheme. By now, almost everyone's heard that Ginny Thomas texted with Trump Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. Broadly, the texts encourage Meadows to help overturn the election. That's damning in and of itself. But some of the most shocking details of her messages haven't gotten enough attention. For example, the very first message she sent to Meadows references a video by Steve Pachenik, a former State Department official infamous for claiming that the Sandy Hook school shooting was a false flag operation. In another text, she referenced a popular QAnon theory about watermarked ballots in over 12 states that have been part of a huge Trump and military white hat sting operation in 12 key battleground states. QAnon? False flag operations? Ginny Thomas appears to be someone fully immersed in far right wing conspiracies, not a casual or accidental conspiracy dabbler. She also quotes from a QAnon message board. Quote, Biden crime family and ballot fraud co-conspirators are being arrested and detained for ballot fraud right now and over coming days and will be living in barges off Gitmo to face military tribunals for sedition. Say what now? She thought that the Biden family were going to get detained. She wanted them to be detained and tried at Guantanamo Bay like suspected terrorists. These messages are absolute bonkers and absolutely calls for concern about Justice Clarence Thomas, who has not only not recused himself from cases concerning the 2020 election, he voted as the sole dissenter, eight to one, to block the public from knowing more about the January 6th insurrection, including, now we know, any potential role his wife may have had in it. So, what are Democrats going to do about it? To impeach a sitting Supreme Court justice, you need only a simple majority in the House which, hello, Democrats have. But as of this moment, only one House Democrat has called for Thomas's impeachment. Two more have called for him to resign, and a fourth has said he dishonors the court. That's it. That's all we've got. Some Democrats say that impeaching Justice Thomas would put them in a bad light leading up to the midterms. Really? Polls show almost three quarters of adults believe that the Capitol rioters were threatening democracy, putting Republicans on the defensive and forcing them to talk about January 6th every day between now and the midterms would almost certainly paint them in a bad light. Some Democrats are reluctant to take action against Justice Thomas because they say that his wife's beliefs don't necessarily reflect his own. But look, don't take my word for it. Just read what Ginny herself said in the Washington Free Beacon earlier this month, quote, like so many married couples, we share many of the same ideals, principles, and aspirations for America. Oh, you do, do you? Joining me now to discuss all of this, NBC News and MSNBC legal analyst Maya Wiley, who is also the incoming president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, and former Democratic senator from California, Barbara Boxer. Thank you both for joining me. Maya, let me start with you. Let's get your reaction to Judge Carter's ruling today that former President Trump, quote, more likely than not, corruptly attempted to obstruct the joint session of Congress on January 6, 2021. What does this ruling mean for Trump legally? How big a deal is it? Well, look, you said it uh, at the beginning, at the top of this. It's not a ruling that has any impact on any criminal prosecution of Donald Trump. It has, obviously, a very important impact for the January 6th committee because it makes sure that they can get the documents that they're entitled to. No surprise that John Eastman lost that battle to keep these uh, documents out of their hands. But it tells us something that we, any of us looking at this evidence, would say, which is there is a pile of evidence that is exactly what the judges said. And it's out in public that Donald Trump repeatedly 
uh, week after week, day after day, having been told multiple times from his own White House counsel, from Vice President Pence's counsel, that he could not do and have what he was asking for, which was a disruption of the Electoral College count. You know, I think the importance of this is, uh, frankly, it puts a lot more pressure on the Department of Justice and on uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland to make clear that they are investigating. The Attorney General said that he would follow the evidence. Yes. And what this judge is really saying is the evidence is strong and there certainly merits a criminal investigation. But, Maya, you rightly point out that the evidence, a lot of this evidence is in plain sight, in public. You mentioned Merrick Garland. Oh, where, oh, where is Merrick Garland? Mark Meadows, who was on the other side of those uh, Ginny Thomas texts, was referred to the Justice Department by Congress three months ago. Why hasn't there been any movement? I can't answer that. I don't know that there hasn't been any movement. For all we know, that there's a very quiet process underway. I certainly hope there is. But I certainly think it's going to be true that the American public is going to be very confused uh, if there is not at some point some clear movement. There's no question that Mark Meadows has earned himself a, a contempt citation, should be taken to court for it. There's no question that Donald Trump has earned a criminal investigation. Uh, and we've he we're hearing that increasingly from the January 6th committee itself, uh, from Liz Cheney. Uh, this is yes. not, these are not new statements. Um, and we have heard that the committee is actively and aggressively still taking depositions, sometimes every day. And that tells us that there's a mound of evidence. Uh, and certainly the Department of Justice should be investigating as well. Senator Boxer, you have suggested that there is a case for impeaching Justice Thomas, and I agree with you on that. But I want to read to you some comments by sitting Democratic senators on this. Amy Klobuchar said that this is a textbook case for recusing uh, from January the 6th related cases. Senator Ron Wyden said Justice Thomas's conduct looks increasingly corrupt, but neither he nor Klobuchar nor any other Democratic senator has suggested impeachment. Why not? Why are Democrats going soft on Clarence Thomas? Feels like an open goal to me. I don't know they're going soft. I think they're going careful. And I think we have a supreme scandal on our hands. And, you know, uh, Maya is the one who is the legal beagle here. But I am um, my son's a lawyer and my husband's a lawyer. My dad was a lawyer. <laughs> but I read uh, two citations today uh, that I will share. They're very brief, OK? So this one is uh, 28 U.S. Code Section 455. And this is what it says, and I'm quoting. Any justice shall disqualify himself in any proceeding in which his impartiality might reasonably be questioned, or if his spouse has an interest that could be substantially affected by the proceeding. So by not recusing himself, Clarence Thomas has broken the law unless this law no longer applies. My understanding is it's still in the code. And then for Mrs. Thomas, if you look at the parts of the Constitution that deal with sedition, it says, anyone who tries to delay the execution of any law of the United States is guilty of sedition. And that is 18 U.S. Code Section 2384. So I think we have a huge scandal on our hands. Point is, I think they've already, my opinion, just from what I know, and, you know, there yeah. has to be an investigation, it looks to me like laws were broken. And so I would certainly not take but impeachment Senator, off the table. Yeah. Isn't the problem what you just cited about the conflicts of interest? All of that applies to federal judges, but Supreme Court justices aren't bound by the conflict of interest rules or the ethics guidelines that the rest of the federal ju judiciary are bound by, which means the only tool you have available to you as a senator or a member of Congress is impeachment, according to the Constitution. You, you can write a letter. I mean, Democrats oh, are the masters of sternly, of sternly worded letters. Do you think Clarence Thomas is going to say, Amy Klobuchar told me to recuse myself. OK, I'll do it. He's not. No, no. No, no, no. What I read to you was directly from... Uh, U.S. Code Section 455, in which it says any justice, judge, magistrate judge. So it does cover justices. Now, where we are with the Supremes, they don't have a, 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 an ethics code, which is outrageous in and of itself. And I think, you know, you can look to the Senate and the House, and we should, 
but we have to look to the chief justice of the court uh, because chief justice should immediately say we need to have a vote and we need to abide by the ethics code. But but honestly, what I read to you was the law and it says justice. So it does cover yeah. the Supremes. I guess it's an enforcement issue then. Maya, let me ask you about Ginny Thomas, because Senator Boxer just read out uh, some, uh, talked about sedition and the consequences she could face. What legal exposure do you think Ginny Thomas, a private citizen who is in writing, uh, encouraging the overturning of the US government, uh, what legal consequences, what legal exposure could she face? Well, it really depends on how the evidence turns out. Let's just be clear about that. Um, there's no question that uh, there's there's uh, evidence of conspiracy. That means more than one person having an agreement to defraud the government, meaning stop it from doing its job, like counting electoral votes um, and sedition. And so if there is a conspiracy and it looks like there's agreement to me between more than one person and, and wh whether or not she is one of the people who is part of that agreement would then make her just as subject to criminal prosecution as anyone else in the conspiracy, as long as she took a step, an act in furtherance of it. But these are the things we don't know yet from the texts. We certainly know, and, and, and I, I couldn't agree more, that this is a person who is listening to falsehoods and conspiracy theories and apparently believing them oh, yes. in a way that is deeply disturbing. And that in and of itself is not illegal. So the question becomes what <laughs> more, what other actions, uh, because being crazy is not illegal. <laughs> it's not illegal, but you have to wonder uh, how her husband didn't know what she was up to, what she was saying, what she was planning. Um, oh. Maya, let's just change tack while yep. I've got you here. Sorry, go on, okay. make your point. I just, this no, no, is a really make, make your point about Clarence Thomas. A really important point is Jenny Thomas has one of the texts specifically makes reference to her speaking with her best friend in her exchange with Mark Meadows about the fact that they weren't letting this go, meaning trying to uh, ensure that Donald Trump stays in office. Yes. And she's known to have been referring to Clarence Thomas as her best friend. So the question is, that is that evidence that they were having the discussion. It yes. sounds like it may be, and it certainly merits an investigation. We, we don't know for sure, obviously, but yes, she has referred to him in other exchanges in the past as her best friend. I guess that's something that needs to be investigated, as Senator Boxer pointed out. Before I go back to the Senator, Maya, quick question to you on another subject, just from your legal perspective, civil rights perspective. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed the Don't Say Gay bill into law today, surrounded by young children. Talk about uh, politicizing kids. What is your reaction to that law that is passing in Florida? This is just astoundingly um, destructive, disturbing, and frankly, a violation of some fundamental rights. I mean, certainly, to there's the First Amendment itself, how you can actually try to control what people say and how they think is just sort of core to our freedoms in this country. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and it's specifically because he has a disagreement, a political and ideological disagreement with people's identity. Well, you know, frankly, that is something that we have to protect in this country if we're going to protect our democracy. Um, and I think what is and so disturbing about Go ahead. I just sorry. Want, I, sorry, we're running out of time, so I'm going to jump in because I do want to ask one last question. Sorry, Maya. One last question to Senator Boxer. Talking of Florida, Matt Gates, congressman, on Saturday at the Trump rally, Senator, said that he wants to make Donald Trump Speaker of the House if Republicans win back the majority, which apparently they can do. Who knew? You don't have to be a member of the House to be Speaker. That's the latest crazy idea from the Republicans. Dangerous, some might argue. What do you make of that, Senator Box? It's frightening as heck. Uh, I served in the House for 10 years, and we all know how powerful the Speaker's office is. They could actually pull it off. But I don't think it's going to happen. I have more faith. I mean, I keep saying that, and I keep praying that. <laughs> that we have more faith. But I have to say, um, I just want to jump in here because I represent California and we've been such a, you know, we've moved ahead on civil rights for the LGBT community before anyone else. Yes. And we are so much the better for it. What Ron DeSantos is doing, I think, is a sin against God because I think we're all God's children. Now, that's my free speech and that's where I see it. 
Well, we appreciate your free speech, which is why we like having you on. Senator Barbara Box and Maya Wiley, thank you both for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Coming up, President Biden's new budget has a new tax on billionaires in it. In contrast, Republican Senator Rick Scott wants to raise taxes on the poorest Americans. And even Fox, even Fox wasn't buying his BS defense of that plan on Sunday. That would raise taxes on half of Americans and potentially sunset programs like Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security. Why would you propose something like that in an election year? Sure. Well, John, that's, of course, the Democrat talking point. It's a no, no, it's plan. in the plan. <laughs> It's in well, the plan. But, here's, here, but here's this thing about reality for a second. It's First of all, let's talk but, about but, but Medicare. Senator, but Senator, hang on. John. And, so it's not a Democratic talking point. It's in the plan. A tip for Senator Scott. If you're going to go on TV, even Fox, to promote your agenda, you should probably know what's in it. We'll be right back after a very short break. We should all agree the answer is not to defund the police. It's to fund the police. Fund them. I've said it before many times on this show. The idea that the Democratic Party supports taking money away from the police is nothing but a Republican talking point. Every time Democrats try to refute it, they just give it more attention. And the White House continues to do this. The Biden administration released its annual budget request, $5.8 trillion, to Congress today. And a briefing document from the White House includes an entire section titled Funding the Police. Why, oh, why are they still elevating this bogus claim from Republicans, which Republicans will continue to repeat no matter how much money Biden spends on the police? And that's not the only talking point that the White House is basically conceding today. The budget proposal has a significant focus on the deficit, something Joe Manchin and, of course, Republicans have cited again and again as a reason for railroading the Biden White House's agenda. Then there's the Pentagon budget. President Biden is seeking a 4% increase over last year, despite the U.S. finally exiting Afghanistan after 20 years of war and Biden proudly telling the U.N. that America is no longer at war. Yes, the situation in Ukraine is fast changing. But as Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders wrote today, at a time when we are already spending more, than the mil more on the military than the next 11 countries combined, no, we do not need a massive increase in the defense budget. And for reasons beyond me, the budget does not request any emergency funds for fighting COVID, which is still literally killing hundreds of Americans every day. So that's the bad news. Here's the good news. There is something in the president's budget today that we should really, really celebrate. And it has to do with billionaires. Let me remind you that this pandemic has already widened the vast gap between the top 0.1 percent and the rest of us. And as I've told you on the show before, a study from Oxfam found that the world's 10 richest men, a list including Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, doubled their fortunes in the first two years of the pandemic. Their combined wealth went up by more than a billion dollars a day. But under the current U.S. tax code, they may not owe much more in taxes. Take Jeff Bezos. You might be surprised to learn that his salary last year was about $80,000. His Amazon stock holdings, on the other hand, have grown about $10 billion a year. Unless he, sells that stock, unless he sells that stock, he's not taxed on it. It's outrageous. Well, today, President Biden said he wanted to change that policy. A firefighter and a teacher pay more than double, double the tax rate that a billionaire pays. That's not right. That's not fair. And my budget contains a billionaire minimum tax because of that. A 20 percent minimum tax that applies only to the top one hundredth of one percent. One hundredth of one percent of the Americans will pay this tax. The billionaire minimum tax is fair and it raises three hundred and sixty billion dollars that can be used at lower cost. President Biden's budget proposes that for the first time, certain investment gains for the wealthiest Americans be taxed. Households worth more than $100 million would pay a rate of at least 20 percent on their income and also on gains in the value of their assets. Look, this is fair. In just the first year of the pandemic, America's 600 plus billionaires got more than a trillion dollars richer, while at the same time, 80 million Americans lost their jobs, incomes, houses, millions of Americans suffered. And it's good Policy, too, as President Biden said, this revision would mean $360 billion in new revenue. And it's good politics. 
No one wants billionaires to get away with dodging taxes. In fact, 68% of voters said last fall that they support raising taxes on America's wealthiest. A billionaire's tax will help Democrats come the midterms. I mean, here's what Biden's policy would mean for some well-known names. Elon Musk would contribute $50, 50 billion dollars more. Jeff Bezos, $35 billion dollars more. Warren Buffett, $26 billion dollars more. Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren has long pushed for a wealth tax. During the 2020 Democratic presidential primaries, she famously sparred with hedge fund billionaire Leon Kuperman over her proposal to raise taxes on the rich. Here he is in one interview where the topic came up. People can not only see the emotion on your face, but hear it in your voice when you talk about this, Lee. Why? I care. That's it. Elizabeth Warren didn't make it to the White House, but Joe Biden did. And if this new tax proposal of his can make billionaires like Cooperman cry, then I'm totally down with it. Still to come. The world is watching an attack on democracy in Ukraine as world leaders across the globe push for peace. Is there a chance for diplomacy? I'll speak to Ukrainian MP Kira Rudik about what her country needs to defeat Russia. We're back in 90 seconds. We talked at the beginning of tonight's show about the prospects for a possible diplomatic resolution to the conflict in Ukraine. The Russian delegation arrived in Turkey today ahead of another round of negotiations with the Ukrainians. Meanwhile, Ukraine's foreign minister said today that their maximum ambition from these talks is a ceasefire. But that, quote, we are not trading people, land or sovereignty. That could, however, prove to be a particularly difficult sticking point. Russian President Vladimir Putin has repeatedly insisted in public addresses that Ukraine as a sovereign country doesn't exist and ridiculously describes its government as run by Nazis, suggesting it isn't a real democracy. That last false claim that Ukraine isn't really a democracy is often echoed by the American far right. Last night on MSNBC, as part of a special episode on the global fight for democracy, I spoke with Ukrainian lawmaker and opposition party leader Kira Rudik. Have a listen. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Uh, Kira, the theme of our special show tonight is democracy versus autocracy. There are some in America, on the political right especially, who think America shouldn't be backing Ukraine because they say it isn't democratic enough. Have a listen to Fox's Tucker Carlson. The point here is to defend democracy. Not that Ukraine is a democracy, it is not a democracy. Ukraine's president has arrested his main political opponent. He has shut down newspapers and television stations that have dared to criticize him. So in American terms, you would call Ukraine a tyranny. As an elected Ukrainian lawmaker, the leader of an opposition party who is now rallying behind your elected president, what is your response to statements like that? Hello, thank you so much for having me. Well, Ukraine is a democracy. And again, as a leader of oppositional party, as a person who used to criticize President Zelensky up to the day one of war, I can tell you, my rights uh, are not taken down right now. We are working as one team, this is true. And uh, in Ukrainian parliament, when we are gathering, we are voting all together. But I can tell you right away that before showing this unity to people, we have uh, four hour discussions with my partners of other political parties every single day before we come to consensus, before we come to conclusion. To show our people that we are united, to show our people that Ukrainian parliament is working as one, uh, is critically important right now. To show that democracy and democratic institutions work. But behind that, I can tell you, there are still political parties, there are still different views. And the point that we have agreed within ourselves that we will be coming uh, out as one does not mean that we changed our political views. So as a liberal party, we are still standing for our liberal values and discuss them with all the arguments with our partners in the parliament. However, I still think it's critically uh, important for our country that uh, the parliament rather will be showing the consensus every single time we are uh, at the sitting. 
Kira, the Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S. was on Meet the Press today, making the same point that your president has been making, that Ukraine doesn't need U.S. boots on the ground, but does need an unlimited supply of weapons from the U.S. But will that be enough weapon supplies for Ukrainians to continue to hold off this ongoing Russian assault on your country? Well, this depends on what is the goal. If the goal is to continue the war, then yes, everything that we need is unlimited supplies. Keep adding oil to our fire. We will standing up. We will be fighting Russians and we will be pushing them back. They will be pushing us forward. We are fighting against one of the largest armies in the world. However, if we need to win this war, and we as Ukrainians, we do need to win this war, then we need something more than just unlimited supplies. We need the fighter jets, we need the Air Force protection, we need those Patriots, we need the S-300, everything that we have been continuously asking for. We need to protect our skies. The issue that we are seeing right now is that Russia is doing uh, very poorly on the ground, and this is why we are fighting them, but they are doing very well in the air, and this is why they are able to destroy our cities, and this is why they are able to keep us in a constant threat and of destruction. You said a moment ago very passionately, Ukraine will and needs to win this war. Uh, Reuters is reporting today that President Zelensky told Russian journalists he might be willing to put Ukrainian neutrality to a referendum as a way of ending the war and getting a Russian withdrawal. Is that something you would support doing, the referendum, and support voting for neutrality as a way of ending this horrific conflict and getting the Russians out? Well, first of all, president saying that he will do referendum again is telling you that we are democracy. Second, uh, I do not believe that the peaceful agreement with Putin would ever work. Look, in 2014, when he invaded our eastern territories and took the Crimea, we had a neutral status. So I do not believe that the issue is in the neutral status itself. The issue is in this, like, the new security agreement that the whole world needs to get into. Because no agreements with Putin will matter until we get the security guarantees from the yes. uh, other countries. So we be, uh, without that, there is no point in referendum. Without that, there is no point in uh, agreeing to something with Putin. Last quick question. You went viral globally last month when you posted a picture of yourself with an AK-47 saying you were going to have to learn to use it to protect your country. Correct me if I'm wrong, but thankfully, you personally haven't had to use it so far. But how many people in Kyiv are there, like yourself, who aren't men signing up for active military duty, who aren't leaving the country but are willing to stay, fight and kill if, God forbid, the time comes? Uh, you're right. Uh, at this point, I didn't have to use it, but I'm training and on 33rd day of war, I'm much, much better than on the day one. And I'm proud that I'm giving this privilege to be able to uh, have a perspective of fighting with our armed forces if there will be a need. Uh, there is like half of the population of Kiev, 2.5 million people who left and 2.5 million stayed right now. And uh, many, many of us are armed and uh, uh, continuously joining the resistance uh, that, that is getting yeah. ready to fight Putin's forces. So we are getting ready. Every single day that we uh, are not getting Russians in Kiev, we are getting more and more prepared. We are getting um, more and more resilient and we are making Kiev, our capital, a real fortress. Kira Rudik, we will have to leave it there. I hope you never have to use that weapon, and I hope you can continue to stay safe. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you, and glory to Ukraine. That does it for me tonight. Join me tomorrow night when I'll speak with the last person to serve as Afghanistan's finance minister before the Taliban took over his country. He is now, I kid you not, an Uber driver here in Washington, D.C. That is a conversation you will not want to miss. But before we go tonight... The besieged Ukrainian city of Kharkiv was supposed to hold its annual classical musical festival this weekend. But organizers found a way to pull it off, bringing musicians together in a subway station to perform what they called the concert between explosions. As the festival's art director told the Washington Post, music can unite. And in moments like this, it really did.
Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.